Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today for In Perspective. My name is Ryan Doherty, and I serve as the Director of Donor Relations here at Denver Seminary. Denver Seminary is a graduate level theological institution that prepares men and women to engage the needs of the world with the redemptive power of the gospel and the life-changing truth of scripture. We're so excited that you're with us today. Today's panel event is on the subjects of faith, work, and rest. As humans made in God's image, we're called to work. And yet, as modeled by our creator, we are also made to rest. This panel will explore the relationship between our God-given calling to work and our mandate to rest. What are common roadblocks to organizing our lives in ways that honor both of these callings? How can we unify all aspects of our lives in a faith-filled dependence on God? Together, we will discover God-ordained rhythms for a sustainable life that impacts how we live in faith and fulfill God's mission in the world. I wanna provide a bit of guidance as to how our panel will proceed. First, while you will be able to see our participants, our panelists today, they will not be able to see you and you will not be able to see one another. We will not be using the raise hand feature or the chat feature during today's panel, but instead we invite you to submit questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. You can use the upvote feature to mark if you have the same question as someone else, or if you are interested in hearing a particular question answered. We will not be able to answer all questions, but we will do our best to answer the ones that are most relevant to our conversation. And because we wanna keep the Q&A queue clear, we will move any items that are not questions off of the list. At the end of today's panel, you will be sent a recording of the webinar within a week. Before we begin today, I do just wanna make you all aware as you are continuous learners of a unique and exciting opportunity that we have here at Denver Seminary. Denver Seminary has launched its first fully online book club, the New Testament Book Club. Denver Seminary will select and send you books written by seminary professors, and you'll have two months to read each book. Following each reading, we invite you to participate in a Zoom online event with the book's author, during which the professors or authors will help you gain a deeper understanding of the New Testament, show you how to defend its truth, and encourage you to really a deeper walk with Christ. There will be a time for you to ask questions. This book club lasts two years, and the first year concentrates on the writings of Dr. Craig Blomberg and Dr. Joey Dodson. The cost of this book club is $125 a month, which includes books, teachings with the professors, and a financial gift to support Doc Denver Seminary's Dr. Craig L. Blomberg, Endowed Chair of New Testament. We invite you to join us for Denver Seminary's first fully online book club. We're so excited to learn alongside you. And if you're interested in learning more, you can visit denverseminary.edu slash ntbookclub. Today, we are excited to begin our conversation on faith, work, and rest. I do, before we begin, we get to inform you that Dr. Scott Wedig will not be able to moderate our conversation today due to unforeseen circumstances, but we have the wonderful and amazing and intelligent Dr. Patty Pell joining us today as our moderator. As such, I'd like to invite Patty to join us by turning on her camera and unmuting herself while I provide each of you with an introduction to Patty. Dr. Patty Pell received her BA from the University of Wyoming, her MA in Biblical Studies Old Testament from Denver Seminary, and her PhD from University of Aberdeen in the UK in the field of public theology. She has served in ministry as a campus staff member, area director, a social re associate regional director, and training specialist with InterVarsity. She has also ministered as a college pastor, adults ministry pastor, and pastor of community outreach. She led a church planting team that established an immigrant and refugee congregation in Greeley, Colorado, and most recently served on the preaching team at Cornerstone Community Church. Patty has published several books and study guides with InterVarsity Press, and today she is the Assistant Presser of Theology, Justice, and Social Advocacy here at Denver Seminary. She also serves as the program director for the Master of Arts in Biblical and Theological Studies and has been the Christian Thought and Ministry Division Chair for the past three years. Most recently, Dr. Patty Pell was named the Director of the Gospel Initiative here at Denver Seminary. Patty, thank you for joining us today and serving as our moderator. At this point, I'll hand off the conversation to you for you to introduce our panelists. Thank you, Ryan. It's a pleasure to be here. 
Um, and I'm really excited to invite our panelists um, this morning to also unmute and uh, show, share their video so we can see their faces as I introduce them as well. Great. Um, let me begin by introducing um, Joanna Meyer. Um, Joanna serves as the Denver Institute for Faith and Works Director of Public Engagement. She hosts the Faith and Work podcast, and she founded Women, Work, and Calling, which is a national initiative that disciples women for godly influence in public life. Prior to coming to the Institute, Joanna worked in global telecom, nonprofit consulting, and campus ministry with crew. She's also served as associate faculty here at Denver Seminary. She has an MA in social entrepreneurship from Baca Graduate University. She is the author of Women, Work, and Calling, Step Into Your Place in God's World, and is a contributor to the multi-author book, Women and Work, Bearing God's Image and Joining in His Mission Through Our Work. Welcome, Joanna. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much for spending a little bit of time with us. Our second panelist, um, Dr. Ryan Tapolowski, uh, is the Assistant Professor of Theology here at Denver Seminary. He holds a PhD in Systematic Theology, a Master's in Theology and History from the University of Edinburgh, and a Bachelor's Degree in Biblical Studies from Colorado Christian University. Prior to joining the faculty at Denver Seminary, Dr. Tapolowski served as an adjunct professor and associate faculty here at Denver Seminary and also as an adjunct professor of theology at Colorado Christian University and postgraduate instructor in theology and ecclesiastical history at the University of Edinburgh. He serves as the lead pastor at Foothills Fellowship Church in Denver and as theologian in residence at the Denver Institute for Faith and Work. Welcome. Tapolowski, wonderful to have you. Great to be here. Thanks. Um, yeah, I am wondering if um, I could ask kind of an introductory question to both of you uh, that might serve as a framework and a structure for the whole conversation. I'd like to kind of locate our conversation of faith, work, and rest within a broader frame of the faith and work con conversation and movement. So um, perhaps we could start by having each of you kind of summarize your understanding of the integration of faith and work. What are the you know, main principles that should guide us in thinking about faith and work in that integration as we then expand it to talk about rest? So maybe we can start there. And Joanne, I'd love for you to start us off. Yeah, I think the um, conversation on faith and work that has really grown over the last 20 to 30 years is one of the most exciting trends in Christendom today because it invites every believer into the broader work that God is doing in our world and it affirms the giftedness and role that every believer plays. And so it's a critical part of our discipleship of the average believer is um, to really press into their role that the work plays in, in God's work in the world. And it, it draws from that foundational principle that Christ through his death and resurrection is restoring any area of the world that has been broken broken by sin, or that does not exemplify the goodness, the beauty and truth of God. And so as we think of like the ramifications of the resurrection, what God is doing, the renewal of all things invites every believer to understand both their God-given identity as image bearers and their participants in God's renewal of the world. And so it puts our work, our public engagement right at the center of God's mission in the world. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, I mean, Joe, I think that's amazing. I would only, uh, I would only add that it's also seeking to recover something that's really deep in our bones as Protestant Christians, which is the yeah. the doctrine of the priesthood of all believers, mm -hmm. right? Where we're trying to resist an understanding where truly real spiritual work is reserved for clergy and for missionaries and perhaps care mm -hmm. workers and perhaps teachers in an emergency, but every other kind of work uh, is instrumental in the sense that we. We earn money so that we can give it to work that really matters. What the faith and work movement is trying to do is help uh, lay Christians to recognize that their work also contributes to the mission of God. It has a value that will last into God's future. Um, and that, uh, the, that we all have a vital role to play in God's mission to reconcile all things to himself. And work is one of the ways we do that because we spend most of our waking hours at work. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you both. That's um, really helpful um, to you know, identify this conversation that's been happening for quite a while now in terms of um, the mandate of work and the integration of that. 
with our faith. And I want to expand it a little bit to now include kind of rest in mm -hmm. that. Um, and ask a similar question that Joanna, you already started to kind of um, uh, address, but why the conversation around faith, work, and rest has gained so much momentum mm -hmm. in the last 10 years or so. And then maybe you can start us off and, and speak to that specifically. I think part of it is that we don't rest well and modern life is pushing us to constantly be on. I think of two just social factors. One is the rise of the smartphone. I have my phone sitting right here on the desk. It allows us to be always present and always on, not just to work, but to technology, to information, to just engagement with um, conversations and social media. And so that makes it difficult to truly unplug and rest. And the pandemic has changed what work looks like. Um, you know, it brought work home for many people, which meant the lines between work at the office per se, or work at a factory and work at home looks like so that there's an increasing ability to always be on or always be un accountable to work. And we're still, even though we're, you know, we've moved out of the pandemic, the social changes that that begin are still playing out in our lives. And so understanding how we have a healthy separation between work and rest and patterns that preserve that are critical for this moment. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, excellent, really critical. It becomes more and more difficult, doesn't it? As more and more technology invades uh, different spaces of life. Um, thank you. Uh, I, I want to, Ryan, address this to you as the theologian in residence at the Denver Institute, um, and maybe you can talk us through a little uh, more of the theology around work and rest being um, both good, and so what does it look like for us to view work and rest both as good rather than one being an escape from the other? Yeah, so what I'd want to do here is 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 start by framing it within some broader cultural trends, right? Mm -hmm. So I think part of the reason that the faith and work conversation has really taken off, especially over the last 15 years, but it's been going on for a while, is I think that we're starting to see uh, some really profound disorientation around uh, the meaning of human existence. What is our purpose? What is our identity? Um, and I think has really accelerated in recent years. And I think that actually the pandemic has put it into hyperdrive. Mm -hmm. um, way back in the 1980s, the, the Catholic novelist Walker Percy wrote a book called Lost in the Cosmos, mm -hmm. in which he argued that actually modern societies, technocratic societies like ours, are growing increasingly bored. Um, and our boredom is a kind of metaphysical boredom. Uh, and metaphysical boredom can manifest in a few different ways. And one of the ways that it manifests is through hyperactivity right? We're just afraid that our lives don't really mean very much. So we throw everything we have uh, into our work. Um, and that's resulted in, you know, the, the journalist Derek Thompson uh, has has called this workism. And he's mm -hmm. he's called it the official religion of America, workism. Yep. Uh, that's our, it's our one last hiding place of transcendence and purpose and identity. And what the Christian faith can offer is actually a view of human meaning and transcendence and identity that has a place for work, a really prominent place for work, but without making work the whole shebang, right? Which which results in all kinds of distortions that really, really degrade our humanity and um, uh, and drain the vitality out of our personhood. So what Christian faith can do is sort of offer this image of work as vital, but also by punctuated by regular rhythms and intervals of rest. Uh, we, and when we follow those intervals, we actually more closely align with the kind of creatures that we are and that we're made mm -hmm. to be. We function better when we do that. Wow. Excellent. Joanna, do you have anything to add to that? You were I love it. I think that that emphasis on workism is so true and realizing that. I think even in the social media age, there's an unpaid form of work for a lot of people, and that is managing your public presence through social media or just staying engaged. And, and that's another form of engagement um, that saps our energy. Yeah, yeah, excellent point. Um, well, let's, uh, we've laid some groundwork, I, I think, in terms of faith, work, and rest. And I'd love to dive a little deeper into the understanding of rest um, and different ways in which that manifests and how we can understand that. So um, if I could address this to both of you and Joanna, you can maybe start us off on this one, but what should rest look like? Um, you know, how do I know I'm appropriately ceasing from work and fostering true rest? 
Um, that's a, a tough question. I, uh, I know in my own mind that I am frequently or internally trying to figure out or discern, am I working? Is this work? Is this rest? Does this count as work? Does this count as rest? So um, mm -hmm. what do you think rest really looks like? I think there is a ton of freedom here. Um, and that's one of the biggest changes from previous generations. I think of my grandparents um, and they had a more legalistic approach to the idea of practicing a Sabbath where the Sabbath was not a whole lot of fun, involved a lot of church meetings and a lot of sobriety, not related to alcohol, but just seriousness. And, and uh, it was an enjoyable day. So I think that starting place is just saying, are you being intentional about rest, not just in little spurts, but having a, in a time every week where you are removed from the profession, uh, pr the pressures of the world and really allowing your soul to unwind and unplug. I know in my own life, I have a personal tendency to fritter away time and think I'm resting, um, but it isn't as rich as it could be because I haven't thoughtfully stepped back and say, what do I actually need to feel rested? I think it's helpful to look at your own schedule and say like, hey, you may think that you're not working by being at a so bunch of social events on the weekend. And while those can be really fun and they could be part of your equation for rest, a full calendar really is not going to contribute fully to what you need um, to be able to rest. And so one thing that has helped me in evaluating practices of rest for my own life, um, it they come from a book called The Rest of God by Mark Buchanan. That's a little older. There've been a lot of books on Sabbath keeping that have come out recently, but um, Mark says, how do you stop and ask yourself what's missing? What do you need to reform your soul from the daily forces that misshape it? Um, so that's the first place to start. And it takes some thought of saying like, what is the unique combination for you that allows your soul to come back into a healthier rested place that God would intend it to be? Uh, Tim Keller has some thoughts on this. May he rest in peace. He's been a wonderful voice on, on Sabbath, but he talks about doing something that's avocational on a day of rest, something that's difficult, different than how you would normally spend your days. If you're in front of a screen every day, or you're sitting on your butt in front of a computer, like do something that's away from a screen and is doing some physical activity, but actively working against the forces where you spend most of your day, include time for reflection and beauty. And that could come in different forms for everyone, but making sure there's time where you actually have a chance to reflect, not just react to what you're seeing in the world around you and including some level of relational engagement in that, that might be for family or friends focusing just on your family. I have a, a friend with young kids for whom the idea of Sabbath keeping is challenging because the age of her family and they practice just a Sunday afternoon shutdown and everybody jokes about it in their circle of friends, but their family is unavailable for about three or four hours on Sunday, not even picking up the phone, but they intentionally just shut the household down um, to focus on being able to rest. And that has worked for them in this season. Um, but those are a few of the principles that helps me help me figure out like, what are the components that will help me feel truly rested? Thank you. I love that. Um, doing something that's different, an mm -hmm. alternative, the majority of the type of work, or even the type of activity that we have during the week, doing something that's a different or alternative. Um, Ryan, anything you would like to add about that? Or what, what does rest, what does it look like? What should it look like? Yeah, I would want to follow up on a point that Joanna made um, that I think is really important. Um, if you look at the scriptures and you look at Genesis 1 and 2, what you're seeing in Genesis 1 and 2, among other things, is a sort of liturgical structuring of time. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, so, sorry. I have a time-sensitive um, lights, and if I don't move enough, they turn off. And Brian, that happened smaller. to me the other day on a webinar, too. <laughs> they turn off multiple times a day, uh, which is probably not great uh, for my cardiovascular health. Jazz hands. Uh, um, now, listen, uh, when I talk about liturgical uh, sanctification of time, uh, that word might scare some people away. I'm a mm -hmm. Baptist, right? So like li liturgy is not a huge part of my faith tradition. But what I mean here is what Genesis is trying to get you to see mm -hmm. is that on the Sabbath day, something ought to be happening that mm -hmm. does not happen on the other six days, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, when God sanctifies the Sabbath, the, the word that is used there, both in Hebrew and then in Greek translation, the word means to set apart, right? So it means mm -hmm. this day has got to look different than other days, right? Christians have uh, often made a distinction between sacred time and ordinary time to capture mm -hmm. this distinction. So I think what I would say here 
um, is that if your Sabbath day looks just like the other six days, it mm -hmm. isn't rest. Yeah. Um, and uh, in Colorado, which is my context, um, what this often looks like is um, a sort of work hard, play hard mentality, mm -hmm. which is a cool bumper sticker to put on your Jeep, but it's horrible theology actually. And yeah. it'll grind you down. You're not that sort of creature. You're not supposed to work hard, play hard. Mm -hmm. uh, you are supposed to work hard and be renewed, right? So mm -hmm. one question yeah. I would have uh, that you can interrogate your Sabbath with is, is your rest making you tired? Amen. <laughs> <laughs> I think for a lot of people, it does. They come back from the weekend and they're totally drained from their recreation. So my yeah. concern as a theologian and as a pastor is that we're recreating ourselves to death. Um <laughs> And here to play fundamentalist advocate, yeah. right? So is, uh, is I think actually some increased sobriety around the Sabbath actually might help yeah. us. Uh, the Sabbath, I think, I mean, it's there's no real way to read scripture and come to any other conclusion that the Sabbath mm -hmm. involves worship with the people of God. Mm. Um, and so if you're not ever stopping uh, to worship and be renewed by the presence of the living God in God's people, uh, then um, it shouldn't really come as a surprise that we we feel tired and we don't feel a sense of the abiding presence of God in our work week. Um, one last thing I would add. Um, it's interesting that we're made in the image of a God who rests. Why? Well, why does God rest? I mean, that sounds obvious. Well, he doesn't rest because he's tired. He yeah. doesn't rest because he needs to recharge his batteries. What he does is he rests to delight in the fruit of his labor. And so I'm concerned that we've got a culture in which we labor and labor and labor and actually mm -hmm. never stop to reflect on it or delight in it. Yeah. Um, so a few thoughts there. I oh. want to add to what Ryan said is that um, good rest is a complement to good work. It's not an escape from work. It's a reorientation of our, of our hearts and our schedules that allows good work to happen. They're integrated and go together. Oh, wonderful. Um, thank you both so much. Really helpful. The emphasis on work hard, play hard, and that that is not a restorative formula that we can feel the same amount of pressure to be recreating and to mm -hmm. be involved in recreation that fatigues us and overwhelms us just the same as our work. Um, and depending on our context, that can that can really be a a heavy burden. Um, since we've opened the door um, a bit on Sabbath, I'd like mm -hmm. to follow that topic up a little bit. Um, and we've been talking about a Sabbath day. Is it, does it have to be a day? Um, does resting mean I need a, to keep a Sabbath day? Or, uh, you know, there's some conversation around rest each day of the week and, you know, Sabbath in mm -hmm. different kinds of, um, time frames you know can we have parts of sabbath or should it be resting a little bit each day in lieu of a whole day can maybe you can speak to that a little bit and joanna i'll um throw that out to you first hmm oh, and i want ryan to weigh in on this one <laughs> from the theological perspective you know a couple of thoughts would be uh small bursts of rest scattered throughout our week or just healthy living when you think about it, like we all need to be able on a daily basis to have uh, both work and rest uh, in any 24 hour period. I would say you need enough time every week, whether it's a fixed 24 hour period, or often if you're a parent of young kids, that just isn't conducive to that season of life, but intentional stepping away from the pressures of life. That's what you need every week. Um, Enough that you feel like you can reorient who you are. That was the word I had used earlier, where you're helping your heart and your soul and your mind step back from the pressures of the daily um, daily grind to say like, God, I will reflect on the goodness of work and also of the beauty of you, who you are and the relationships that you've given me. Here's a quote from um, that book I had mentioned by Mark Buchanan that helps me frame this. It says, Sabbath keeping is more than time management. It's a fresh orientation to time where we think with holy imagination about how the arc of our moments and hours and days intersect with eternity. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that type of reflection only comes with intentional chunks of time. Although what those chunks of time may look like um, differs from person to person. I think it echoes Psalm 90, 12 that talks about teaching us to number our days aright that we may gave, gain a heart of wisdom. We need to have enough space that we're able to have that sense of reorientation reflection. 
Ryan, would you like to add? Because I think Joanna would love to hear your yeah. input. Well, to start, to start, yeah, I would echo what Joanna has said. Uh, in, in a really um, excellent book on the Sabbath, um, the Jewish theologian um, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel has, mm -hmm. written, uh, uh, has written that, uh, precisely to Joanna's point, uh, the Sabbath is not actually, in the Judeo-Christian tradition, it's not actually a life hack so that we can live sort of balanced lives. Um, yes. It's actually a way of inhabiting the world and more particularly inhabiting time and the way that God intends creatures to inhabit time. And Heschel calls this um, a, a sacred architecture of time as opposed to a mundane. Now, in the Hebrew imagination, uh, profane doesn't mean bad, right? Uh, we hear profane and we think profanity, right? Or um, we think about profaning something. Profane simply means ordinary and it means distinguished mm -hmm. from sacred. Mm -hmm. um, so profane time is good. It's most of our time, uh, but it can't be all of it. And we've got to find a way to inhabit some sacred time uh, or else we'll be going against the grain of God's world and we'll be going against the grain of our own nature as God's creatures. So should you take a whole day? Well, listen, in a perfect world, my answer to that is actually yes. Um, and there's a few reasons for this. Now, let me add a caveat. I, you know, I, I serve as pastor to a congregation where a lot of people have to work on Sundays. Uh, the nature of our economy is such um, that is hard, especially if you're working in the service industry or in retail. Um, and, uh, you know, not to mention sort of, uh, for lack of a better term, jobs in the information economy where you're you're almost literally always mm -hmm. on. Um, so I realize that not everybody can take a whole day. Uh, and and uh, it's certainly uh, not my intention to sort of make anyone uh, feel guilty for not being able to. But I would raise a couple of questions that are worth considering. Uh, and I'll just use myself as an example. Mm -hmm. It's hard for me to go even a few hours without checking my email. Mm -hmm. What does that say about me? Yeah. Uh, what does it say about me that uh, I'll often say I can't afford to take a day off because there's too much work? Well, that rests on a bad theological anthropology. It rests on a bad understanding of what a human mm -hmm. being is and what we're for. And one of the things the Sabbath is meant to do is to remind us that God sustains the world. We do mm -hmm. not. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if I think we often feel this tremendous anxiety about taking time off because work just seems to accumulate. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? Work will uh, continue to accumulate. And even if you check your email, it won't stop it. <laughs> right. So uh, God sustains the world. I do not. So one of the things the Sabbath does is it actually lets us live into our creatureliness which is good news because we're creatures. That's what we're supposed to be. Uh, God is God. We are creatures. So let God sustain the world for one day. You don't have to. Yeah. And I'll tell you, pastorally, I found this to be true. I found it to be true in my own life, my own professional life. Almost never is something as urgent as it seems. What will really happen mm -hmm. if you answer that email on Monday instead of Sunday afternoon? Mm -hmm. Right? I'm a theologian. There are no mm -hmm. real emergencies. It's not like there's going to like a bomb's going to blow up, right? I can, I can answer my email on Monday uh, and you probably can too, whatever you do. Yeah. yeah. It's countercultural. Even as you're describing that, Ryan, I think that is not the way the world works. And to have that sense of ability to trust in God by unplugging is key. Yeah. Yeah. I think that um, the being forced to trust the Lord is such a key part of the Sabbath that reminds me, I think it's Eugene Peterson, and, you know, one of his older writings, right, that, that talks about, you know, it, the Sabbath is not the system where you take one day off and then you take the same amount of work that you would do in seven days, and now you cram it into six. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that's not a posture of trusting, but when you step out of life, so to speak, and you step out of those places of work, and say, I'm not going to check that email or do that for a day. It is a matter of trusting that what mm -hmm. needs to get done will get done. Other things will not get done, but that it yep. doesn't rest solely on us, that God is, yeah, the one in charge. So thank you for that reminder, mm -hmm. both of you. Mm -hmm. We actually have an audience question that I think would be good for us to address. And thank you all. This has been such a meaningful conversation already. So the audience question that we have is, I can feel guilty resting because there's so much I could or should be doing. 
how can I change my mindset about rest so that I feel the freedom to rest from work? Great. Um, Joanna, you look like you're ready. To yeah, I would, I would say um, God rested. Jesus rested. We saw it into, I mean, I think about the three years of Jesus's public ministry and how much he might have felt he needed to get done during that time. And there are times where he clearly steps away from the incredible good world changing work he was doing um, during those years to be able to rest God in his creation of the world intentionally rested. He certainly had plenty of things he could be doing. Oh, here we go. Now it's time for my jazz hands. Hold on. Let me quick turn the light back on. Um, but, but I think we see that example culturally. I think another factor that we see is understanding your context, like what really is going inside on inside that makes it feel, yay, we're back. Um, what culturally is going on inside that makes it feel like it's difficult for you to rest. There are implications of this for people in ministry of saying, do we have a church culture that I'm operating in or a ministry con culture um, that is spiritualizing over work? Mm -hmm. If you're in the corporate sector, for example, maybe you're in a position of leadership. Are you setting an example for your people that actually doesn't allow them to rest? Are you emailing them at odd hours? Are you jumping in on the weekend? And is there a subtle implication that they need to be watching their email too, because of the example you set? Like there are some things that are actually baked into our working culture that make that more difficult. Um, and so being able to step back from that um, can really help. And I think just asking yourself, like, do I have certain idols or fears that are changing the way that I think about my daily work? Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Brian, anything to add on that? Yeah, uh, I, yeah, I think uh, what Joe said is excellent. Um, and on uh, along the same lines, and and um, someone from the audience has asked about rest as a discipline. Ryan, I know I'm I'm not supposed to monitor it, but I can't. I couldn't help. It's a it's such a good question, and I think it's really relevant here. Yeah, um, I think it is very significant um, that Shabbat in Hebrew, Sabbath day, Shabbat, that's a command. It's in the imperative voice. And the word means stop. It literally just means stop. It means quit it. I had no idea. That's yeah. amazing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It means stop day. Stop day. Uh, uh, yeah. And so um, why is that significant? Well, think about it. Why does Israel have to be commanded to stop working? That's interesting, mm -hmm. right? I don't have to be commanded to stop working, uh, or I, I should rephrase that. I don't have to be commanded to stop coming into the office. Uh, I can always find something to do mm -hmm. almost compulsively. But it's very interesting that Israel has to be commanded to stop working. It's actually mm -hmm. one of the, the main commandments they're supposed to follow. And in fact, I was just reading in uh, Deuteronomy last night, just uh, incidentally, that uh, the penalty for profaning the Sabbath was death. So Yahweh says to Israel, stop working or I'll kill you, right? Interesting. Why do they have to be told that? Well, think about the context of that command. Mm -hmm, They're mm -hmm. being given it right after they're delivered from slavery in Egypt, where they have been subjected for decades to mm -hmm. an unrelenting schedule. And what's interesting yeah. is that they no longer have a category for non-productive time. Mm -hmm. They are so, so bound by the pressures of work. And in fact, the Hebrew word for Egypt is Mitzrayim, and it means narrow place, mm. right? And so then when God delivers Israel out of narrow place, he brings them to broad place, mm -hmm. right? Which is how Israel is often described in the Hebrew scriptures. And they don't know what to do with the freedom. Mm -hmm. So they just keep working, right? Mm. And there's a couple of really funny scenes in Exodus wow. 16 where uh, they try to hoard manna, even though God told them that it's going to spoil if they do they try it anyway. And we do this constantly. Mm -hmm. We hoard work because we're afraid there won't be enough the next day. Mm -hmm. uh, but then it spoils. And then he tells them, hey, there's not going to be any manna on the Sabbath day. So don't go out and try to harvest it. And then they're like, okay, cool. Got it. And then they wake up on the Sabbath day and go out and try to harvest it. Right. So they have to be told not to work. So rest is a discipline for them. And mm -hmm. it has to be a discipline for us. We are uh, obviously not in an identical situation. We're not uh, subjected mm -hmm. to forced manual labor, but we are feeling tremendous pressure by a culture of optimization. We are, mm -hmm. uh, there is an anthropology at work in our culture that basically means to be human 
is to uh, absolutely make the most of every ounce of your day, every ounce of your abilities. You know, I get sucked down lots of internet rabbit holes and one of them is like life hacks. And I, I click on the life hacks and it's like, oh, like you should get some sleep. It's like, okay, cool. Glad I, I wasted half an hour reading that. Um, and you know, I, I don't, I mean no offense to anyone, but we wear devices on our wrists to gauge how well we're resting. Yeah, We wear uh, Fitbits and uh, Apple watches that measure our sleep. And so now actually sleep becomes something that we perform and measure and it becomes a source of anxiety. <laughs> we work hard even at resting. <laughs> have anxiety uh, about anxiety. That's right. It's just so exhausting, right? Uh, you mentioned Eugene Peterson, Patty. Uh, he refers to the Sabbath as non-functional time. And mm -hmm. we basically don't have a category for non-functional time. So my advice for a discipline, if you struggle with this, is make yourself take some time where you do not accomplish anything. Just stop being, stop mm -hmm. trying to be productive and, and actually stop trying to be productive in a hobby. Stop trying to be productive in your professional life. Maybe just exist and uh, let God delight in you and delight in God without having to prove anything. We live our whole lives trying to prove our worth to people. Why would we want to do it on the Sabbath day too? Are you thinking about work when you're not at work? Your employer is not paying you to think about work or to worry about it on the weekend. Mm -hmm. Yeah, such wise words. Thank you. Um, I just want to highlight a connection between a couple of things that you two have said. You know, the command, the seriousness of the consequences connected to Sabbath um, being so important for the community as a reorientation from mm -hmm. their um, days of enslavement. And what you were saying, Joanna, that are we creating an environment for others to where they can't rest? Um, and, and that makes me think of, you know, the seriousness of that command, because if if the Israelites don't um, honor the Sabbath and participate in the Sabbath, they're creating what they left, right? Um, uh, a context of hard labor and enslavement. And we can do that as as employers or, you know, um, parents or we can create a context, an environment where we expect uh, work all of the time as well. And um, yeah, so um, let me change a little direction a little bit and talk about the fruit that we mm. might or might not see in our lives. If we're resting appropriately, what fruit should we expect to see? What fruit might we see in our life? What's being manifested if we're resting appropriately? Joanna, could you speak to that? Yeah, I think I would start with saying, um, what is the negative fruit of not resting? Like what are the character qualities or the ways that you behave when you're at your worst, when you're not rested? For me, it can be uh, anxiety. I get more angry. I tend to see the world in a negative light. Even people I love, like my colleagues and friends, um, those are all indicators that I'm not resting. So the contrast of that would be when my tank is full, when I've had a chance to reorient in my perspective on life, God, and myself, what are the qualities that I see in my life? And so I think it would be reflected in a hopefulness, an ability to keep things in perspective um, because I've had a chance to step away, um, a renewed imagination for life and work um, where I've had some space where a creative idea or a new idea can be birthed, not just getting things done or checking things off my to-do list, but a place where a sense of freshness or newness can exist. Um, uh, relational health, like I don't show up edgy and um, aggressively towards the people in my life. All of those are the fruit of good rest. Yeah, excellent. <laughs> I, I meant to remind you. Right? <laughs> well, it's an life. energy efficient age, right? I have my lights go out at regular intervals. So I take micro naps as a way of practicing the Sabbath in my office. <laughs> um, what should we expect to see if we're resting like we should? Uh, yeah, Joanna referenced anxiety. That's a word that gets used a lot these days. Um, and I think there's some concept creep here. So let me define my terms, right? So I, I think anxiety is a fruit of overwork, uh, but I don't mean anxiety in a sort of clinical sense. Mm -hmm. I mean it in sort of the Jesus Sermon on the Mount sense, right? Mm -hmm. So when Jesus says, um, 
you know, look at the birds of the air, consider the lilies of the field. They don't toil, uh, they don't spin, they don't reap, they don't sow, they don't put things into barns. Jesus seems to have been um, carefree in a way that's really hard for us to understand, um, mm. even though he had uh, a lot more to worry about in, in some ultimate sense than we did, right? So sure, Jesus doesn't have a mortgage, right? He doesn't have to worry about saving for retirement. He doesn't have committee meetings. Uh, well, I don't know. It depends on what you think about the disciples. So I, maybe he had a lot of committee meetings, um, <laughs> but you, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. But Jesus uh, seems to be able to inhabit the world with this sort of trust that his father is good and that his father will take care of him and that he will have enough uh, and that God will supply his needs. Um, and, you know, and when Paul says, you know, be anxious for nothing, what is it that, that he's actually telling us to do there? That's an astounding thing to say to someone. Um, and in the, the Greek word for anxiety, it's related to, um, it's related to uh, etymologically to having your mind in two places at once. Mm. Uh, so to be anxious is to, to not have your mind in one place. Um, and so when we, re when we rest, when we're fully present to God's renewing presence in the Sabbath, it actually means that when we go back to work on Monday, we can be fully present. Our mind isn't somewhere else. Our mind can actually be present to work because we've rested, which will sort of reduce our anxiety. So um, I think one of the fruits of good rest is, is having your mind in one place. It's very exhausting to have your mind in multiple places. Great insight. Thank you. Um, I'm going to uh, direct this next, next question back to you, Ryan, because we briefly spoke about this uh, just this morning, the idea of work-life balance. Um, that's, uh, that's terminology that we see all over the place. And I'm curious to know if, the, if you think the uh, notion of work-life balance mirrors this work-rest conversation, or is that something different? Are those the same Synonymous, or are we really talking about different concepts in terms of work-life balance and work-faith rest? Yeah, uh, yeah, it's a great question. Uh, let me just say this: uh, I I am not by nature of a, a contrarian, although I th I fear that I'm I'm coming across that way in this discussion. I'm usually a pretty agreeable person, but here I'd have to raise an objection actually to the way that uh, we're conceiving of the entire issue. I, I think theologically speaking, biblically speaking work-life balance gets the order wrong. Uh, mm -hmm. I actually think the biblical writers would want us to see life-work balance. And I say this for a couple of reasons, right? And, and, and here, uh, we're back to that question of the architecture of time, right? We're conditioned as Westerners to think about time very, very differently than a Hebrew person would have. Um, but there's two, two, I think, key insights here that are really going to help us with this work-life balance thing. Number one, go back and read the scriptures, read Genesis 1 and 2, and realize that human beings are called good, they're called very good before they do anything. Mm -hmm. Okay, so God creates them, and simply their being is good. God delights in them, they haven't achieved anything, there's no aspect of performance, right? So anytime we get into this mode where our worth depends on performance, we're actually out of the biblical imagination right away. The second thing is that uh, day one for, for humans is actually uh, day seven for creation, which is the Sabbath day. So human beings uh, come onto the scene and they don't get right to work. Their first thing they do is nothing, right? So uh, life comes before work in the biblical imagination. The, sec the same thing is reflected in the way that Hebrews conceive of time, right? So uh, you and I, Westerners, we wake up and we we think of a day as starting in the morning. We wake up to greet the day, right? Carpe diem, seize it. Uh, for Hebrews, uh, days start in the evening. Days begin when we think of our days ending. Now, why is that significant theologically? Well, it means that for the first part of the day, when the day begins, humans are asleep. They are not contributing anything. Uh, God is on the clock, Yahweh. And so when we wake up in the morning uh, to greet the day, Yahweh is like, cool, welcome to work. I've been here for 12 hours while you were sleeping, right? So even the way that the Hebrews think of the rhythm of day and night 
is, is forcing them to depend on a rhythm of grace where God sustains the world while we contribute nothing. So um, when we are trying to sort of work first, life second, we're just out of sync uh, with sacred time. Um, and so one practice that has helped me with this, um, I call it the shift change. Uh, and when I'm going to sleep, uh, I am a textbook worrier, right? I, I just talked a little bit about anxiety. I'm the least qualified person to give that talk, right? So like, just hear that, you know, like I wake up with a like a stiff neck and a normal person would be like, oh, I slept wrong. And I'm like, what's the rarest form of meningitis and how did I get it? And how long do I have to live, right? So that's the kind of person I am. So I, I, I come to bed carrying a lot of anxieties, lots of worries. And one of the practices I try to do is I, I pretend like I am punching out and God is punching in to start the day. And I say, here's all the stuff that was left on my desk at the end of the day. I don't know how to resolve it. I don't know what to do with it. But I know you're going to be working while I'm asleep. So here it is. Mm -hmm. right? One of the ways I would try to condition myself to get on God's calendar and not mine. Beautiful. Yeah, that's really great. Beautiful. Anything to add on that, Joanna? I think, I think this is a very important conversation. I do not like the term work-life balance. I understand the heart behind it, that we want to have a sense of all things in proportion in life. Um, I would much prefer a concept of whole life integration. I think work-life balance implies that um, real life happens outside of work. And I think biblically we live with God in all of life. And so that means the question of how do we integrate our walk with God in everything that we do is it's a favorable look at work. Um, but I think it's critical, especially for women, as I've, um, you know, spent years coming alongside Christian women who are wrestling with the pressures of work. And to be honest, secular women are wrestling with these questions, too, of how do we steward all of the responsibilities that God has given us? Increasingly, men are asking these questions, too. But for a second, I just want to sit with Christian women on this, is that, um, you know, historically, we often looked at work outside the home as if it was secondary to a woman's responsibilities and caring for a family. And this sense of separation, this work-life balance feeds into this, the idea that work outside the home might be a threat to your relational commitments and your stewardship of a family. And it creates this false dichotomy of what life looks like. It also creates this pressure of uh, be very wary, your, might, your life might fall out of balance. And the reality is we live with God in all things. All things are part of the broader stewardship and the call that he gives us. And so there's a question of just saying, Lord, how do I steward these in the proportion and the priorities that you give me? And I think that changes the tone of the conversation. It doesn't, it doesn't demonize work. It sees work as a good thing, but one that we are thoughtful and the role that we allow it to take its place in our lives. And also um, it helps us not be afraid of falling out of balance and just saying, okay, so maybe I'm out of, out of proportion. I'm a little disintegrated in this moment. What does it look like to begin to shift in a healthier direction? Yeah, wonderful. Thank you both. That was great. Oh, wonderful. Just hoping we had a question from the audience. Yes, and we actually, this will more likely than not be our last audience question. This has been such a wonderful conversation, and we do just want to transition a little bit to talk about practical elements of how we can teach people or coach people or encourage people to break habits and advocate for rest in a culture that encourages us to always be on. So we had an audience member ask this question. I think a lot of people struggle with unplugging from work emails on the weekend. What are some best practices to apply to be more successful to do this besides just do it? If you're in leadership, have you communicated with your team ever about your expectations for them on the weekend? Like you communicate very clearly of saying, hey, at the end of the workday on Friday, I do not expect you to be answering emails over the weekend. If you want to come back in online on a Sunday night, and this is assuming people have, you know, fixed hour jobs, but, you know, if you want to come back in on Sunday night and check in, that's welcome, but I don't want you answering emails the weekend. Do you model that by example, or have you communicated, hey, if an email comes in for me on Saturday, I don't expect you to answer it. It simply is the time that it's best for me to be able to, to be dealing with my email. So there's a implications for people in leadership 
I would say also like, are there certain things that you could do uh, when you're not working, even if you're working shift work, so it's not defined by Monday to Friday, could you turn off the notifications on your phone? Can you turn off the color on your phone? Anything mm-hmm. that would make you less tied to whatever is going to get you thinking about work. Those are two kind of practical steps that you could take. Another is just looking at your life over the course of a month and just saying, am I pleased with what rest looks like? Am I excited about the opportunities to recharge my soul? Um, or, or begin to ask like, what would really do it? And what does it look like to actually intentionally put it in there? Just start experimenting. That's the fun thing is that Sabbath doesn't have to be legalistic. It's a grand experiment for you to explore what will bring you rest. And then practically like, how can I put enough good things in there that I don't want to get pulled back into my work email? Great. Love that. Ryan, what do you have to add? Uh, I think that's great. I think uh, Joanna's right that I think this is really all about expectations. Mm-hmm. Um, for example, I'm a I'm a pastor. I'm also a professor. I teach at the seminary. Mm-hmm. At the beginning of the semester, it's in my syllabus, and I also announce it on the first day of class uh, that if uh, you email me over my Sabbath, I just will never ever ever respond, uh, and I say it just like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of our assignments are due on Sunday nights. Uh, and so sometimes students say, well, what if an assignment is due on Sunday night? I say, I will email you on Monday. And guess what? No one, is, no one emails me over the Sabbath uh, because they have the expectation. Uh, I also do this with my congregation. They know that if they text me or email on a Sunday, they're just not going to hear back until the next day. Mm-hmm. Um so I think setting expectations is important. And if you're really worried about missing something or making uh, people feel like they're not being attended to, you might even just think about uh, setting up an auto reply on Friday or whenever you head into your Sabbath and just say, hey, thanks for your email. Like I'm, I'm resting, I'll, I'll, write, I'll write you back when I'm back at my desk. Um, and I think a lot of times um, junior employees feel like they can't do this. Mm-hmm. Um, and I would I would suggest that actually you might be surprised. Uh, I'm I'm in this line of work now, but for nine years I worked as a legal clerk at a very busy family law firm, right? That had uh, disasters unfolding at all manner of hours and over the weekend. Um, and I was a junior employee there. I did a lot of grunt work, and so um, I would have lawyers emailing me asking me to do stuff at all hours, and. Uh, Eventually, I got to a place where I, I just felt sort of confident enough to say, hey, you know, I don't I don't work on Sundays. Uh, and I was really worried about this conversation because I thought, uh, you know, well, then we'll find someone who does. Well, guess what? They said, oh, OK. <laughs> they just didn't know. Right. So I think uh, being clear and communicating your ex- expectations actually goes a long way. And to join this point, too, if you're in a position with a lot of agency in your organization, then you need to set the tone on the culture here which means that you don't email your employees over the weekend. Uh, you don't ask them to work over their Sabbath. You don't even implicitly sort of suggest that that's what we do around here. Uh, you've got a lot of agency to, to set a culture where people are not in a narrow place, but in a broad place. Hey, Ryan, what does rest look like with young kids? <laughs> uh, it's not it's not physiological, I'll tell you that. Uh, I've I've had to learn to sort of get my mind in one place. Uh, And so when I'm with my kids, what helps me the most is changing my frame of mind that this Mm -hmm. is what I'm doing. This is where my mind is. Uh, This is what matters right now. And my work will be there. Uh, Because truthfully, I'm just being honest. I don't know if we got people on the call who are parents of young children. Uh, When you've got young kids, I I have a four-year-old and a two-year-old. Uh, in this season of life, work is the rest. <laughs> uh, sitting in my office reading theology books is the rest. Um, <laughs> so I have to I have to work to sort of be present to them and change that frame of mind to get my place my my mind in one place um, and to learn to just delight in them and be renewed by them. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm just we're just tired all the time, as any yeah. I think parent will tell you. I'm just asking, what does the spirit of Sabbath look like in your life? It's not a formula. It's a, it's a great adventure. And I mean, what a wonderful invitation to explore yep. what genuine soul giving rest. Well, even, even on a practical level, our kids know that Sunday is different than other days. Uh, so for instance, they get pancakes for breakfast on Sundays and they know that we're going to go to church and 
uh, our daughter gets to watch her one movie a week, her Sabbath movie, which for about 60 consecutive weeks has been the same Octonauts movie uh, that I've seen many, many times. Um, and they know that uh, we'll, we'll usually go do something fun or out of the ordinary as a family in the afternoon. So we've tried to at least instill a sense that this is different time. It's not ordinary time. It's not time for working. It's time to be together. So that's one, one way. Right. Oh, thank you. So many practical ideas. Um, I think it's important to that you said it's, it's not formulaic. Um, you know, even talking about kids as you progress through the stages and ages of your kids, the things that feel like rest and feel like more fatiguing will change depending on who you are and your kids are. And yeah, so a lot there to be led by the spirit and less formula. Well, I, um, I want to give you to the last word here. We have, uh, just a couple minutes left. And so um, quickly, if is there anything else you'd like to say on this topic? And then also, um, is there anything you're working on that you'd like to share with, with those who are participating with us in our audience? Mm. So things, and um, Joanna, let's start with you and then I yeah. can close. I'd say learning to have a regular pattern of rest is countercultural from an American way of life. Uh, and so it's one of the most powerful things that you can do in your own life and for the people that you can lead. And it's a delight. God is inviting you into delight. Um, and so giving yourself the freedom to do that and really becoming disciplined at it and learning to do this, what a critical thing to do in this season of life. So have at it. I would love to hear what you're discovering as you have practices of, of rest in your life. So uh, this is the start of an ongoing conversation. You can find me at Denver Institute to talk about this. As far as what I'm working on right now, uh, I'm thrilled by what God's doing through women work and calling here at Denver Institute. This uh, was a small event that started here in the Denver area and had us now now grown to have a national and international presence and is growing beyond just a single day event. We now have year round programming uh, to allow women to think about what it looks like to grow in their God given influence in public life. Um, and it's a really rich and timely conversation. Uh, I have a book coming out with University Press this fall called Women Work and Calling. Um, the event itself will be November 4th here in the Denver metro area. But if you're listening beyond uh, Colorado, we'll live stream it. We're actually looking for host sites, uh, churches, or groups of people that would want to be a hub for this conversation conversation on event day. Um, and we'll have tons of other fun opportunities to plug in. You can find that at womenworkingcalling.com. Thank you. All right, Ryan. Yeah, I would just add that if you uh, are not familiar with women work and calling, you are really, really missing out. Uh, the, the events are great. The resources they produce are great. There's no one doing it better in the faith and workspace. So uh, go to that event. You don't have to be a woman. Uh, I have profited oh. a lot uh, in, in my engagement with women working calling and learned a lot. So if you don't know Joe's work, uh, you should get acquainted. Uh, the only thing I would add, and it's just to reiterate a point that we've already made, is practicing non-functional time reminds mm. you that you are a creature beloved by God and your value does not depend on your performance. That's why Sabbath is important. So uh, yeah. you can step off the hamster wheel and simply know that you are accepted uh, because uh, of what Jesus Christ has done for you. You're united to, to Jesus um, and you're his, right? So it doesn't depend on your performance. So step mm -hmm. out of uh, that performance mindset. Um, yeah, I, I uh, collaborated on a book with Ross Chapman, who is the executive director of Denver Institute for Faith and Work. We produced a, work, uh, a book together in collaboration with Denver Institute called Faithful Work, which comes out with uh, InterVarsity Press later this year in the fall. And I'm also working on another book for InterVarsity Press with Dr. David Bushart here at the seminary, which is a theology of work that is trying to grapple with the realities of fallenness and finitude. What does work look like in a world broken and distorted by sin? Mm -hmm. So that will be out someday. No idea, but uh, that one's in there too. Denver's oh. becoming a hub of great thinking right now. Yeah, good work being done. Um, well, those are great opportunities for our um audience members to take advantage of both with through the Institute and the work that both of you are doing. So thank you so much, Joanna and um, Ryan, thank you for spending this hour with us and expounding really on your experience and your work and your um, deep thinking on this topic. We really appreciate you being here. So that's all we have for today. And um, I want to say thank you again and goodbye. And we will call that the end. 